What is the best indicator for how physically fit someone is? Well, if you looked at the title, you probably guessed it. It's your VO2 max. Your VO2 max is the maximum amount of oxygen your body can use when you're exercising. So having a higher VO2 max is better because it means that your body's using oxygen more efficiently. Now, this isn't just for fitness, it's also for living longer. Now, based on this, you would think that athletes have the highest VO2 max levels, and they do, but you'd be surprised that even athletes in just a couple weeks can still improve their VO2 max levels by doing certain exercises. Now, the first way that anyone can improve their VO2 max involves your breathing. One exercise you should do every morning is a normal inhale and exhale and then after the exhale, see how long you can hold your breath until you have a subtle urge to breathe. You don't want to be dying to take your next breath. That's not the point of this exercise. This can be a good gauge for your current VO2 max level. Now your goal here should be to hold your breath for 40 seconds until you get that first subtle urge to breathe. And this comes from the book Exercise Physiology. And the book says if a person does a normal exhale, it should take them about 40 seconds before they have that urge to breathe in again. Now, if you can't get 40 seconds, don't get discouraged because even most athletes only get about 20 seconds. Now, why is this breath hold test so important when it comes to your VO2 max? Well, it's because the longer that you're able to hold your breath, it means that your CO2 or your carbon dioxide tolerance is better. And if your CO2 tolerance is higher, that means that your oxygen efficiency and therefore your VO2 max is higher. You see, most people think that carbon dioxide is just a waste product and we need to get rid of it. But that couldn't be more wrong. Your carbon dioxide is just as important as oxygen. Now I'm going to use this diagram to explain why. So when you breathe out, you breathe out carbon dioxide. And when you breathe in, you breathe in oxygen. Now you don't get your carbon dioxide from the air around you. It's only produced in your body by your metabolism or when you exercise. Now your carbon dioxide is important because it has to control your blood pH. If your blood pH is off, then your body could die. So this is really important. And your body's pH doesn't have that much wiggle room. It has to be between 7.35 to 7.45. Now going back to our oxygen, let's say this little Pac-Man guy with these giant lungs inhales this oxygen. Well, once this oxygen gets to your lungs, then it attaches to this molecule called hemoglobin. Now this hemoglobin is a protein in your red blood cells and it can hold four of these oxygen molecules. Now this hemoglobin is kind of like a train and it transports this oxygen to all of our cells. So as it comes in from our body, it gets to our lungs and then our hemoglobin will take it from our lungs to the rest of our body. Now in order for this oxygen to detach from this hemoglobin and go to one of our cells, like for example, the cells in our brain, then our pH has to be at 7.35 for that oxygen to detach. Now in order for that, pH level to be exactly at 7.35, we need to have enough CO2. Because if we don't and our pH level is too high, then our oxygen can never detach and it stays attached to our hemoglobin. So even though our oxygen is going to our lungs, it doesn't mean that it's actually going to our cells or our muscles like when we're working out when we desperately need it. This is also called the Bohr effect. So that means that even if your oxygen saturation, which measures the amount of oxygen attached to your hemoglobin in your lungs, which you can measure with just taking a pulse oximeter and putting it over your finger, even if that is 100%, it doesn't mean that that oxygen is actually going to your cells if you don't have enough CO2. And this is also why if you improve your CO2 tolerance or the amount of CO2 that your body can tolerate without feeling the need to breathe, then it can improve your VO2 max. Because if you have higher tolerance of this, that means that more of this oxygen is going to be being delivered to your cells and your oxygen is going to be delivered more efficiently. And this is also why people, when they go to higher altitudes like Colorado to train and they come back for a sporting event, why they're at such an advantage. Because they're training in conditions that have lower oxygen but they also have higher CO2 there. So they're forced to improve their body's CO2 tolerance and also forced to tolerate lower oxygen conditions. The other benefit that these athletes get when they go to higher altitudes is this artificial blood doping. So you might have heard of Lance Armstrong or some other athletes that got in trouble for this, but blood doping is basically where a few weeks before your competition or sporting event, you get blood drawn from your body and then you store that blood for later. And then a few days before your competition, you put that same blood 
back into your body. What you're doing is you're basically fueling your body with more red blood cells. What that does is you get more of these oxygen carriers. You get more of these red blood cells that have this hemoglobin that can transport more oxygen throughout your body. Now, obviously that's illegal, but there's a natural way to do this, and that's what you get when you go to these higher altitudes. Because when your body is trained in a shortage of oxygen, then it will naturally produce more red blood cells. Because your spleen will start contracting and releasing more red blood cells into your body. And also your kidneys will start releasing something called erythropoietin, or EPO, which also helps mature more red blood cells. Both of these will help you carry more oxygen and are way safer than sticking needles in your arms taking out blood and then putting it back in. You see, right now people have become over breathers, where they're breathing too excessively more than their body needs. Ideal breathing should be about five to six liters of air a minute, but right now people are breathing about 12 liters of air a minute. But this is why you're feeling breathless, because when you're breathing so excessively, then you're draining your body of the CO2, and then your oxygen's not getting delivered to your cells, and this is why you feel breathless and feel the need to take big, gasping breaths, but instead you keep draining your body more out of CO2, and then you're still getting more and more breathless because this oxygen is never reaching your cells. So this is where that breath holding can come in. By practicing this every day, you can kind of use this first as a gauge to see how your CO2 tolerance and therefore your VO2 max is in the first place, but also help train your body to slowly adapt to lower oxygen conditions. Now something else you can do to immediately improve your VO2 max is high altitude training. Now we talked a little bit about that, but you don't have to go to Colorado or these mountains to do that. You can actually practice high altitude training at home by simply changing your breath work. So the basics of high altitude training are breathing less than you feel the need to. When you exercise, your breathing naturally increases because your body's demand of oxygen increases, but also your body starts producing more CO2, which triggers you to breathe faster. So instead, when you force yourself to breathe less than you feel the need to, then you're training your body to tolerate more CO2. So one simple exercise you can do is just trying to get the feel of an oxygen shortage in the first place. So you can do this at home, on your couch or something, but first thing to do is just relax your body and just try to relax your muscles. And then just for a minute, try to sit there and focus on your breathing. See how much your body naturally inhales and exhales. Then after that minute, gradually slow down your breathing until you have a subtle air shortage. Once you feel that subtle need for air, like you wish you could take a deeper breath, but you're not, that means you're doing it right. Now try to keep doing this for about three to five minutes. And if you wanna make it a little harder, try to add a little resistance. You can put a hand over your belly because ideally when you're breathing in and out like this, you should be using your diaphragm. So if you try to put a little bit of resistance on your belly, then you're also gonna be training your diaphragm. If your muscles are starting to feel a little too tense, then you're doing it a little too excessively. Then you should just stop the exercise, relax for 15 to 30 seconds, and then try to get back into it. If you don't keep this up for the first three to five minutes, that's okay. Not everybody is gonna be able to do it right off the bat. And try to do this for two total sets a day. Now, something else you can start doing with your breath is incorporating this into your actual exercise, like a jog or a row. Now, the intensity of how you do this is gonna be up to you because it really depends on how in shape you are. But one way to do this is to do a normal inhale and exhale and then hold your breath and then walk or jog as many paces as you can until you have a medium to strong urge to breathe. For example, I could go jogging or I could go pedaling a bike and then after a minute I'll be warmed up and then I'll do that normal inhale and exhale and then I'll hold my breath and try to get like 10 steps or 10 cycles on my bike and then go back to normal breathing again. And then I would rest for a minute and then repeat this 10 times. This is also really good to do for a warm up. So let's say you're about to go for a run. Before you do that, try just walking and first getting a gauge of how you're breathing and then try to do 10 sets of these same breath holds while you're walking before you go on your run. The reason this is a good warm up is, let's say you're gonna go for a run or do any form of exercise, then your body is going to immediately be building more CO2 and start demanding more oxygen. But your body might not be used to that, so you might feel really breathless. Like, you know if you go for a run in those first 10 minutes, you start to feel really out of breath, and then by the end of the run, then you start to feel like you can keep going? Because in the beginning part of the run, you didn't warm up properly. Instead, if you start warming up like this, and you're basically telling your body, hey, I'm gonna start producing a lot of CO2 soon, so get ready. And then your body won't have that breathless feeling in the beginning of it anymore. And the last breathing tip I have to improve your VO2 max is to try only using your nose to breathe 
when you're exercising. The whole point here is to slow down your breathing. So instead, if you're going for a jog and only breathing in and out through your nose, instead of using your mouth, then you're gonna be forced to slow down your breathing. And again, doing some sort of high altitude training, but also just upping your CO2 tolerance and increasing your tolerance of a shortage of oxygen. What you'll notice is if you keep this up, the first two weeks of breathing through your nose when you're going for a run or a jog is going to be a lot harder. And you're probably gonna to have to slow down your workout. But after those two weeks, if you keep it up, then your breathing is gonna get a lot more efficient and you're probably gonna be in even better shape than you were two weeks ago. The other key with using your nose is you get more nitric oxide. So whenever you inhale through your nose, your air goes through these paranasal sinuses, which releases nitric oxide into the air. Now nitric oxide is cool because it's a vasodilator and also an antibacterial. So first of all, it'll help prevent you from getting sick but also it'll help dilate all these blood vessels. And this will help make sure that your oxygen is getting transported more efficiently and the gas exchange in your lungs is also gonna be more efficient. Now I wanna get into some other actual exercises you can start doing to improve your VO2 max. The two key ones are gonna be zone two training and zone five training. Now first off, any exercise will improve your VO2 max, but if you want to maximize your ability to improve it, then you have to do these two. Now, what's the difference between zone two and zone five? So there's different zones to your workouts. So zone one is typically very easy. It's like window shopping. And zone five is a very intense all out workout. So zone two is gonna be on the easier side. So a good gauge to see if you're in zone two or not is let's say again, you're going for a jog. If you can maintain a full conversation with someone, if you're able to maintain that conversation, but it's a little difficult and uncomfortable to do, that's a good gauge that you're in zone two. If you're having a really easy time having a conversation with someone, then you're probably still in zone one. But if you're not able to maintain that conversation, then you're probably in zone three. So I got really into zone two and zone five after reading the book Outlive by Dr. Peter Atia. And he also says that zone two is especially important for people who are not athletes because zone two will actually increase your endurance for everything else in life. And it'll also improve the efficiency of your mitochondria. Now this is less focused on VO2 max specifically, but this is more about your general health and longevity. But the biggest benefit you get from zone two is that it helps burn your fat the most out of any form of exercise. And it also improves the health of your mitochondria. The reason it's so good for burning fat is because your mitochondria is really good for burning both fat and glucose in the need of energy. So zone two would be really good for someone with a metabolic disorder like diabetes. Now, unlike fat, glucose can be converted to energy in many different ways, but fat can only be broken down in your mitochondria. So why is zone two so good for your mitochondria? Well, zone two is on the easier side of an actual workout, but you'll be doing it for a longer period of time. And when you do zone two, then you're gonna be really using your slow twitch muscle fibers. Now these are really dense with mitochondria. So if you're doing zone two regularly, then you're gonna help keep producing more new and efficient mitochondria. So I know this video was supposed to be about VO2 max. Well, doing any form of exercise, including zone two, will still improve your VO2 max. But zone two is really key for specifically your mitochondria. But it's also important to also mix in some zone five training. Now this is gonna be your actual VO2 max training. And this is basically your HIIT workout or your all out workout. One way to do this again from Dr. Peter Atia is doing a slightly less than all out workout, but trying to sustain this for four minutes. So whether you're going for a run or a bike ride or rowing or swimming, try to go for four minutes at this intense pace and then recover for four minutes by doing a lighter jog or a lighter version of whatever you're doing. And then repeat this four to six times. This wouldn't be a super long workout because you can be done in like 30, 40 minutes, but it will be very intense. Now the pace that you're gonna be doing this is gonna be different for everyone because really it depends again on how in shape you are. If you're someone that never works out versus someone like LeBron James, then you guys are gonna be doing different workouts. So what should you be doing more? Well, according to the book Outlive, you should mainly be doing zone two, but then you can sprinkle in a little bit of zone five. So zone two, you can do three to four times a week, and then zone five, try to do about one to two times a week. Now again, this also depends on your fitness level. You might even wanna do it more. But I will say, don't get too caught up in the numbers and how exactly you're supposed to do everything. Just remember, 
any sort of exercise will improve your VO2 max. And what you can really do is start combining this with that breath work that I talked about before, specifically in your zone two, because those are lighter, easier workouts. So try to only breathe through your nose and try to practice some of that breath holding while you're doing your zone two workout. But even your zone five, you can incorporate this too. Like some track athletes will have these 200 meter sprinters hold their breath for the last 15 meters. A 200 meter sprint is definitely a zone five all out workout. But if you're still holding your breath at the last 15 meters, that's gonna be very difficult. And that's another way to incorporate this breath hold training. Now, the last thing I wanna talk about to improve your VO2 max is your diet specifically adding foods that are higher in nitrates. A lot of athletes and coaches swear by eating foods that are high in nitrates to improve their VO2 max and improve their performance. And they also say that it helps reduce cramping. Now, the reason that nitrates are so important is because they help produce more nitric oxide. And we already had talked about the importance of nitric oxide, how it's a vasodilator and how you get it from breathing in and out through your nose. But again, you can get even more of that by eating foods that are high in nitrates. One of the best foods that have nitrates are beets or drinking beetroot juice. So this study was looking at people who started taking beet juice compared with people who drank water. And it was a group of men between 19 and 38. What they found is just drinking two cups of this beet juice every day for just one week led to a remarkable reduction in the amount of oxygen required to do any form of exercise compared to the group that just drank water. So in other words, their athletic performance improved and their VO2 max also improved. Now looking more into the study, part of the study had these two different groups cycling. The group that drank the beetroot juice were able to cycle 16% longer before getting tired. Tired. Also, their blood pressures dropped. They were still healthy in the beginning and they were still within normal levels, but they still went down. The researchers concluded that this remarkable change in their performance could not be explained by anything else other than simply drinking the beetroot juice. Now, other studies on beets show similar results as well. So what are some other foods that have a lot of nitrates that can help increase nitric oxide? Well, other foods I try to add in my diet are leafy greens, like spinach and kale, fish, dark chocolate, pomegranate juice, green and black tea, and even oatmeal. Also something else you can add to your diet is the amino acid L-arginine, because this has also been proven to help with nitric oxide production, which can also help improve your VO2 max. Now, some people ask me about nitrates in those cured meats, like bacon or other types of meat. I would still avoid those when it comes to trying to improve your VO2 max and improve your nitric oxide levels, because in my opinion, there's just better sources out there that have more studies on them. Like we have actual studies on beets that are actually improving your VO2 max. And I just don't know of any studies on these cured meats. Plus we have a lot of data showing health risks of eating too much of these cured meats or processed meats. Over 27 million people in the US have asthma. The good news is that most people will grow out of this as they get older, but they will still be at a disadvantage compared to most people. Because if you have asthma, you can still have these triggers. You can have different air pollutants or irrigants that can still trigger an asthma attack or still just make it harder